Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. So today we will be talking about crashworthiness. Now because of our ever improving understanding of crash scenarios, of structural integrity, of the kind of forces involved, crashworthiness has come a long way from where it used to be. So in this video we will look at some of the ways how trains have become safer. Now there are multiple standards followed all, all over the world. Um, but one of the most widely followed standards is EN 15227. We won't be going into the nuances of the standard, but we will be using the standard to our advantage to talk about some of the strategies that the standard uses to make the trains more crashworthy. Now, one of the important points is that the standard only deals with passive safety, meaning all of the measures that come into play when active safety has failed. And active safety being things like signaling and train control, or if driver has made a mistake, or your level crossing has failed, or human error has been introduced at some point, basically all of the things after which an accident has become inevitable. So let's look at all of the criteria that a rolling stock design has to address to be crash worthy as per the standard. We'll talk about all of these criteria one by one. So the first one is overriding protection. Now what is overriding? It's in the name, overriding is when the underframe of one structure overrides the underframe of the other structure and it is actually one of the most serious phenomena that occurs during a train collision reason being that when one train overrides the other train then the survival space of the other train which is where all of the passengers are is seriously compromised and all of the passengers in this area all of the passengers here are exposed to catastrophic hazards let's look at a video of how overriding works so this is one train and as you can see the underframe is riding over the other frame and all of this survival space is very seriously compromised now the way overriding is prevented on the trains is using this device called override protection device on some trains it might be conspicuous so you can clearly see but on the other trains it might not be conspicuous but rest assured it's always there and the way it works is that if two trains collide each other head on then these devices on both trains interlock and this interlocking prevents one train from overriding the other train. You might have devices like this, or you might have something else that is attached to your normal coupler. The point of all of these devices is the same, is that they have these protruding fingers that interlock with each other in case of a collision. Now let's look at a demonstration. In the first test, they did not have an overriding protection device. So you can see the train overrode and the other train jumped high. Whereas on the second demonstration, they have these overriding protection devices. So you'll see that during the collision, there is hardly any overriding and the train remains in contact with the tracks. So here, this is with the overriding protection. Now what we saw before was the overriding protection for ends of the train. And now we'll be looking at override protection for the intermediate parts of a train. You could do this by many ways. Two of the ways is you could have drawbar, which have an assembly like this at the end. And this assembly prevents the drawbar from being more than a certain angle. And that then prevents the overriding. Or you could have these Jacob's bogey or these kind of bogies, which by inherent design stop overriding. Now there's a lot of literature in 15227 on overriding protection, but really I only wanted to point out two things. First one being, that when the overriding test is done, then there has to be a certain vertical offset between the two trains, meaning the test has to be done in such a way that trains are more vulnerable to overriding. And the second is that in order to pass the test, they check whether the wheels were in contact with the track or not. Now there are more finer requirements such as the wheels should not lift more than 75% of the flange height or they shouldn't lift more than 100 millimeters of the flange height if the overriding interlocking remains engaged. So there's all of those nuances, but I just want to point out these two things. The next one is on survival space prevention. If you look at these two pictures here, it's very clear that in this picture, the survival space, i.e. space where all of the passengers are, remains intact even though this accident happened at an extremely high speed, whereas this, whereas in this one, the survival space, which is where the passengers are, is compromised. So the second criteria requires preservation of survival space. Now we'll look at a demonstration. Towards the right, you can see that during the crash test, all of the survival space is preserved. On the left, you'll see that after the crash, 
a lot of the survival space, especially this part here, was compromised. What that means is that if the train were to be in a collision, then it is preferred that you have all of these non-survival spaces to be compromised, but the survival space to remain intact. So this scenario here is more preferred compared to the other scenario where you have infringement on the survival spaces. Then there are other requirements in the standard too that on the survival space, you want at least one escape route to be fully intact. So again, there's a lot of liter literature in 15227 on the survival space, and they very clearly describe what constitutes a survival space and how much reduction in length requirements apply to the survival space. So if you have an area where you have all of the passengers, which is your main actual survival space, then the reduction requirement is that length must not reduce more than 50 meter over any 5 meter length, which is all which is close to 1%. Then they say that there are areas of temporary occupation, which is areas where people might stand. These temporary occupation areas must not reduce more than 30%. Then there are areas like gangways, which the standard assumes to be unoccupied. So there are really no reduction in length requirements. The standard also says that if you have these small areas, which are less than 250 millimeter, then that can also be relieved off of any reduction in length requirements. So what the standard is trying to say is that if you have areas small enough where people cannot stand, then you do not have to preserve that space in case of a crash. Same way there are requirements for drivers also, and the standard very clearly explains what the survival envelope or the survival space for the driver is. And they have also explained the logic behind that. The survival envelope comes from the 5th percentile female and the 95th percentile male body sizes. And let's look at this demonstration here. So you can see in the demonstration, there was some level of protrusion into the survival space. I don't know if this crash test was passed or failed. But basically, the point is that you have to preserve the survival space of the cab driver as well. So in conclusion, roughly, if we were to look at a train, then there are these spaces where the driver is, and then there are this, these spaces where the passengers are sitting and pass places where passengers can stand. Roughly, these are the places which have to be preserved in case of a crash. And that brings me to my next point or next criteria is that what do we do with the remaining space? So the criteria number three is deceleration limit or collision pulse. And the reason why I'm showing the car here is because this feature has existed on cars for a long, long time. It's just built in, but we don't realize it. And it's called a crumple zone. So let's talk about it. Now I'm going to play a video which shows you the crumple zone of a Tesla car. And the reason why I picked Tesla car is because traditionally we have had gas car or petrol cars that have engines and that have batteries and all of that stuff in front. Whereas Tesla car does not have anything. And that is exactly the reason why Tesla receives higher safety ratings than the other cars. We'll talk about how. Now let's look at how crumple zones work. So if you were to be in these two cars, one with all of these components in front and one with nothing in front, and if you were to be in a collision, let's look at what kind of forces are involved in both. On the first one, this is the point where your car comes in contact with a brick wall, and this is where your car comes to a standstill, so all of your front gets crushed, but it only gets crushed this much. Whereas in the second scenario, the front can get crushed a lot more because there are no components in front. Based on the basic equations, v square minus u square is 2as. Your deceleration is going to be v square minus u square by 2s. Let's assume a normal situation where your final velocity is standstill, initial velocity is 10 meter per second or 36 kilometer per hour, and you have s1 equal to 1 meter. I would say it's nominal to say this whole length is 1 meter long. S2 is half meter, and if we plug in these numbers, we find out that the acceleration in this scenario is 50, the acceleration in this scenario is 100, so that's almost 10g versus 5g. And if you look it up on the internet, they say that an average human can take about 5g during a car crash, and anything over 5g, it gets extremely painful and it feels like your spine is snapping. So anything over 5G is extremely catastrophic. So that's how crumple zones or zones that can be crushed help with the deceleration because all of the energy is then absorbed by these crumple zones. So as per criteria two, 
if all of this is the survival space that needs to remain intact, then everything else in between can act as a crumpled zone, which will then absorb all of the energy involved in a collision. If you look at the picture here, then you can see that the intercar gaps are fully crushed because they absorbed all of the collision energy and everything else remained intact. Same way, if you see the video here, you can see there are crash absorbers employed which are going to absorb all of the crash energy so that the remaining space can stay intact. Same way with this video, the front has all of these sacrificial zones or zones that are collapsible that then absorbs all the energy. Same way here, the intercar gaps are all crushed. Now there's not a lot in 15227 on deceleration because it's quite simple. They say that if you are to measure the deceleration involved in the crash, then you have to restrict it over 5G or a moving average of 120 millisecond. But you can have the spike which is moving average for 30 milliseconds of up to 10G. In fact, even the pictures that 15227 uses shows energy absorbing vehicle ends, meaning this whole space have to be preserved and this whole space can be used as a sacrificial zone to absorb all the energy. And lastly, we'll talk about obstacle deflector. Now, it might not seem major, but it is actually very critical because the purpose of obstacle deflector is to prevent anything of sufficient size to get under and then go through the running gear. Because if that happens, then your train is immediately prone to derailment. And so that's what obstacle deflectors do. You could have obstacle deflectors that's part of the car body, or you could have them separately attached. Now, obstacle deflectors are not that straightforward. There are a lot of design requirements that apply to those two. First one being they need to be shaped such that if they hit the debris, then the debris is swept aside and it does not just stay in front and the train keeps dragging it. The second one is the obstacle deflector needs to be sufficiently sized so that it is able to incorporate all the size of different types of debris that you can have. And the third one is that if the obstacle deflector is designed such that you can still have debris going under it and might go onto the leading wheel, then you need to use something called a lifeguard. Now, in terms of the design requirements of obstacle deflector for 15227, it needs to be able to withstand all of these forces and all of these energies and all of these different speeds. There's more literature, feel free to go check it out in the standard. But one important point that I want to mention here is that if the load exceed these limits here, and if the loads are so high that the obstacle deflector itself detaches from the vehicle, then it needs to be designed such that the obstacle deflector itself doesn't become a danger to the train. Now let's look at how 15227 categorizes the trains from the angle or from the perspective of crashworthiness. So what 15227 does is that it creates these four categories and these four categories are created based on the collision scenarios that they can experience. So for example, category number one are the regional trains or national trains and they go through a lot more scenarios. They are usually running in parallel with freight and they have a lot of level crossings. So all of that leads to a lot more collision scenarios and higher speeds too. And then if you look at the second category, these are usually metro trains. They are usually running on a dedicated network. Then on those networks, there's usually no level crossing. Then on those networks, there's typically only one types of trains. So that results in different types of collision scenarios. Then the third type of trains are urban vehicles that work on a track sharing operation, which means they could run on your regional network, but at the same time, they could also be interfacing with the road traffic. Then you have trams. To summarize 15227, it basically lists out the speeds on which you need to test different collision scenarios. Again, I don't suggest you use this information as it is. I suggest you go through the standard to understand all of the nuances and all of the exceptions involved with these speeds, but this should give you a high level idea of how the standard works and how the standard requires you to test the crashworthiness. Now, there are some limitations of the standard. And again, we are using only this standard as an example, but every standard might have its own limitation. And it is extremely important to understand those. For EN15227 standard, one of the main limitations is that the crashworthiness is only designed for common scenarios for normal European conditions which means if you're running on network which has some which has different collision scenarios then you need to address those for example i was reading a paper which mentions that on australian networks side impacts on the trains are also very common but there is no mention of side impact in this standard 
So then you need to consider even that into your vehicle specification. Then the other thing is only common collision scenarios are protected against and not all possible scenarios, which is fine because general engineering practice is not to account for all of the possibilities but only reasonable possibilities. Then there are things which are not covered. There are things like doors, there are things like side windows, there's things like design of interiors, whether they have to have sharp edges or whether they have to have blunt edges. Then there are secondary collisions which are not accounted for in the standard but are actually one of the leading causes of injuries during an accident. So there are all of these limitations and this is just a small subset of limitations that this standard has. There are more limitations that you need to be aware of when using the standard or when using any other standard too. Now you need to do a risk analysis to understand if all of those scenarios are, are they even applicable or are there new scenarios that need to be added? For example, if your operational speed, let's say is only 20, then do you really need to test for 36 km per hour? No, I don't think so then you need to look at what type of active safety systems are in place. As I discussed in one of the beginning slides, some active systems might have a good safety integrity. They could be still four, but some active systems might not be that safe and that might lead to new collision scenarios that you would not have thought of. Then there are operational rules in place, so you need to look at those. For example, what speed are trains restricted to when your signaling system has failed? So if your speeds are over 50 or over 60, then that might lead to new type of collision scenarios. Then is the rail system closed or is it open? So are there only one type of train or are there multiple types of trains? Then are there interfaces with road? Because if there are, then that would mean that you can have collisions with, with cars, you can have collisions with lorries or trucks or all kinds of things. Then is there fencing to keep out animals? If there is fencing, then at least some of the collision scenarios can be avoided. But if there's, there's no fencing, you could have large animals pop onto the tracks and become a danger. Then what's the history like? Are, is there a history of people acting maliciously? If there is, then you might need to think of that too. And then what about the nature around it? If it's in a rocky area that is prone to having rocks fall onto the tracks, then that might lead to no new scenarios. So the whole standard has to be risk analyzed before applying it. There might be new scenarios or the scenarios mentioned in this standard might not even be applicable. And on the last slide, we will talk about an accident exposing crashworthiness. So this accident occurred in 2009, it was in Washington. And interestingly, in 2007, three years before the collision, the NTSB cited that the train was vulnerable to telescoping or overriding and complete loss of occupant survival space in an end structure collision. And despite that, they ignored the recommendation and kept using the network. And after it was involved in an accident like this, they confirmed that much of the survival space of the striking train was compromised. So there were basically 80 injuries and nine deaths. And as a result of this, Womata announced a decision to immediately no longer use the 1000 series car, which is these cars, as the lead or trailing units of any of the trains. So thanks a lot and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.